right, thank you, musicians. Uh, that was good. Crown him Lord of all. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Shoalies and Baptist Church. We'll go ahead and start with a word of prayer, and then we'll go to our first song, which is Rock of Ages. But let's pray first. Heavenly Father, we thank you for an opportunity to gather together. Lord, whether a few in person like this right now or uh, others meeting digitally, but we pray that you would help us uh, prepare our hearts now as we sing. And Lord, open our hearts and minds to truths from your word that we need to be taught or that we need to be reminded of. And Lord, uh, instruct us, and guide us, encourage us, uh, admonish us, or rebuke us if there's something that uh, we're doing wrong. Lord, help us to see wonderful things uh, out of your law today. And I pray that you'd help us to apply them in our lives. Lord, thank you for all your blessings to us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's go to 451 if you're using a hymn book. Rock of Ages. Clap for me. get out your Bibles now if you'd like to, or get out your memory verse cards. We'll go over that right at the end of uh, our announcements, and we'll make a couple of those announcements right now. First of all, we've got our teen Sunday school at 9 a.m. on Zoom, and we've got our primaries or junior Sunday school. That's from 8 o'clock onward on the YouTube channel. And then our church worship service is uh, on YouTube as well, and that's from 8 o'clock onward. And then right here on site, Wednesdays at 7 o'clock, we've got our prayer meeting, a short Bible study before that. And why don't you come along to that? Uh, meet with us, and uh, we'll go over some prayer requests, and we break up into small groups and pray together. And then Friday, there is no kids club from the 4.30 uh, point to 5.30. No, no kids club. And the youth will meet at the Hall Home. That's uh, 1 Osprey Road, and that's uh, 6 to a little bit later than seven this time. Actually, I think we, I think we decided to make that at uh, six thirty. Six thirty. So uh, be at uh, our home, One Osprey Road, six thirty, and uh, we'll have some uh, some uh, have a meal there, probably pizza, and uh, have a Christian movie. <clears throat> All right, then uh, on site, uh, adult uh, Sunday school Bible study, ten a.m. at church. Uh, right here. We're not going to have a break during the uh, school holidays. We'll go ahead and uh, just have Sunday school right through. Uh, Pastor wants to do that. Been enjoying those uh, Bible studies and getting to see some of you here. But uh, on the 27th of September, we'll have Pastor Rod Skelton. He'll be our guest speaker. All right, one other announcement then. Uh, October 3, 
On the Saturday, the youth will take a hike in the highlands. It'll be an all-day uh, excursion. We'll start about 9 o'clock in the morning, be back around 5, and we'll have a, a hike on some uh, old abandoned train lines, going through some caves and things like that. And then on the way back, we'll stop at Fitzroy Falls. So that's uh, October 3. Okay, let's go over our memory verse. It's Romans 10, 13. We'll do it twice as we usually do. So let's do that uh, together now. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Isn't that a wonderful truth? Uh, amen. Let's, uh, let's do that again. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. All right. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray for our offerings at this point. Thank you for those of you who've been sending. Some are bringing it into Sunday school, but, but we want to thank you for that. And we'll thank the Lord uh, for that right now. Dear Lord, thank you for the provision that you give to all of us, that you provide for us. Lord, thank you for the work, the jobs, the income. Lord, uh, for taking care of us. And Lord, we thank you for the offerings that have been received. Lord, that we can pay the bills of the church and also support uh, evangelism and church planting and, and missionary efforts uh, all around Australia and the world. So we pray that you'd bless uh, the gifts that have been given. We pray that you'd bless those who are giving. And we pray also that you'd uh, bless and be with the ministries of your people serving in other places, Lord, that we're, we're able to support. So we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now we'll go to 231, Blessed Redeemer. Isn't that a wonderful song? Really good words there about our, our Lord, our Redeemer. I, I can't hear you if you're saying amen out there, but uh, uh, you probably are. What a good song. All right, at this time, we'll have uh, Pastor Shalabert come, and he'll open up the Word and preach to us and teach. So uh, give him your attention, and Pastor, please come at this time. Thank you, Pastor Hall. 
But what a great hymn. Blessed Redeemer. Wonderful hymn. Got to be on the all-time favourites list, I think, that one. And so, But I want to talk to you this morning about uh, that uh, Blessed Redeemer. And uh, we're going to be looking again in the Gospel of Matthew. And I'm continuing on to, uh, to look at some of the things that he said, uh, that our Lord said during his Sermon on the Mount. And so I want to speak to you this morning about uh, um, righteousness, the path to true righteousness. And so we'll have a, a little look at that. So glad you could be with us this morning and uh, do continue to, uh, uh, to pray for us and to uh, uh, attend church whenever you can. And we have those opportunities on Wednesday uh, evening and also, uh, of course, on Sunday mornings for the adult Bible study and Sunday school class. Um, it's not quite as dull and boring as that might sound. We actually have quite a good time. Amen. And so do, do come along and join us if you're at all able to do so. So this morning uh, in Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to read to you a few verses and uh, we'll start uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Just a few verses down to verse 20 this morning. So if you've got your Bible, um, let's, uh, let's turn to that. So Matthew chapter 5 and starting in verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfil. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, Jot, uh, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning as we gather here. Thank you for those who are, are watching on and uh, through the internet. And uh, the Lord, we just thank you for each one. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you might bless them. Uh, bless them that know you and understand, Lord, uh, that Jesus Christ is our righteousness. But Lord, for those who do not, uh, Heavenly Father, I pray that today might be the day of their salvation. But Lord God, whatever it is, uh, we pray that uh, what is said and done here this morning and goes out into the world, Lord, will bring glory to your name. And we'll thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. It's been said that a uh, significant majority of uh, Roman Catholics, a considerable number of Anglicans and Methodists and Presbyterians and some others, um, believe if people are good, if people do good, if they are uh, good to others and do good things in their life on earth, that they can earn a place in heaven by their actions, by uh, their being good. That um, among Baptists, that's not such a high number, but uh, I suspect that there are still some who think that way. In the times of Christ, the attitude of the religious leaders and of the people in general was pretty much that, that... Uh, People believed that living a good life, uh, doing good things, uh, would enable you to uh, have a place in heaven. That they had this kind of picture in their minds, perhaps, of a set of scales, uh, where the things that they did that were good would outweigh the things that they did uh, that were perhaps not so good. And so as uh, they, they thought God had his balances and if the balance was right, then they'd be okay. They believed even that uh, wealth, uh, fortune, uh, was a sign, an indicator of God's blessings. Now, it, it may be that God does bless us financially uh, or so on, but not necessarily so. And so... 
Sadly, today, many people continue on with those thoughts, continue on with that same misconception concerning salvation and concerning righteousness, that goodness, being good, will earn us that place in heaven. Now, we live in an age of many religions. There are people all around us who think that they can and in fact must earn their way to heaven by being good or by doing good. Now, not everybody calls that wonderful thought of uh, a delightful place after this life is done. Uh, they don't always call it heaven, but we will. Uh, for the sake of this message, it'll be heaven. So perhaps there are people watching on or listening on this morning uh, to this message from God's word who believe that way, who genuinely think that by their own effort, by their own goodness, um, they can achieve their place in heaven. But what would it be if you were counting on that to save your soul, to give you a place in heaven, and that was not right? Wouldn't you want to know? Because I think I would want to know. I would want to know what was the truth about how do we get to heaven? How do we live right? In verse 20 of our text this morning, as we read, Jesus says that a certain level of righteousness is necessary before we can even hope to enter heaven. And so this morning I want to show you, challenge you even perhaps, to look closely at your relationship with God so that you might know that you truly are saved. Because what a tragedy it would be if you've been deceived by a wrong thought, deceived by incorrect uh, teachings. We want to know, I'm sure you want to know, where you stand with the Lord. So let's talk about that for a little while. What is God's standard? Well, having told his followers that uh, they needed to be salt, which we looked at a couple of weeks ago in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 5, and then needing to be light, which we looked at not very long ago in uh, Matthew chapter 5 verse um, 15, Jesus went on to say that he didn't come to destroy or overthrow the law or the prophets, but that he came to fulfil. Now, that, that term law or prophets is reference to the Old Testament. Now, we need to think about the fact that in Jesus' day there was no New Testament. Well, the New Testament was written after Jesus' death and we have it in our hands today. And, and it's wonderful to have those things and to have the things that God had given or the thing, uh, to men to write down, those things that Jesus did. And so we, we can be helped in understanding the Old Testament. Amen. But Jesus' ministry was to fulfil or complete those things that had been mentioned in the Old Testament. He himself is the fulfilment of the law. And the scriptures in the Old Testament pointed to him. And it was in many ways a preparation for those of that day, a preparation for them for the coming of the Messiah, for the coming of Christ. The law or the prophets was one way in which the Jews of that day referred, of course, to what we would call today the Old Testament scriptures. And Jesus came not to overthrow the law, not to condemn it, not to put it aside at all, but to fulfil it, not to overthrow that which the, uh, the religious leaders, which the Jews held in, in great regard, but rather to fulfil. Jesus authenticated and exalted the law, and he said, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one, uh, sorry, one jot, or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, the jot was a, a smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and the tittle was a little mark that was an accessory to some of the 
Hebrew letters. And it'd be like uh, we say sometimes, you know, uh, dot every I and cross every T. A and it would be just like that. Um, that's comparable to that. And the significance is that the smallest part of God's word will be fulfilled and will not be lost. Not only have the words of God been preserved, the thoughts and the actions of people have been preserved, but the smallest parts, those little jots and tittles uh, of God's word have been preserved and will be fulfilled. So how much greater is the importance that we must put on the actual inspired words that have been preserved by God? Now, I believe, and I hope that you do, that the Bible that we hold in our hands today, our King James Bible, has been preserved by God so that we can have his word in our hand today. And Jesus went on and he said in verse 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoso shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That's a warning to anyone who was breaking the smallest commandments and it encourages all of us to follow God's word, to look at God's word, to consider the importance of the scriptures and to think about the coming kingdom of heaven. Those uh, who keep God's word will be called great in that day. The problem with the scribes and the Pharisees was, uh, as Jesus pointed out, was that they had substituted the uh, scriptures with their oral and written traditions giving them greater credence, giving them greater importance than the word of God. And so it was, Jesus saw this issue. And Jesus said, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now the scribes and Pharisees, uh, by and large, were uh, pious, um, religious, considerate people. Uh, they maintained uh, their 613 rules and regulations and traditions that were written down in the Torah um, with absolute attention to detail. Their, these embellishments of the law of God uh, that they thought would make a person righteous were upheld and were kept and uh, the, the uh, religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees of Jesus' day were looked upon as being righteous, as being those people which did right. Jesus said that one's righteousness would have to be greater than theirs if one could enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I can imagine that people of that day would have heard Jesus say that and say, how on earth can one be more righteous than these Pharisees who go around with their, uh, their proper dress and doing all the right things and saying the right prayers and, and you know, tithing and everything. You know, they just kind of did all of the things according to the rules. How on earth could one be more righteous than these men? What Jesus was saying here is that apart from being declared righteous in Christ, having that justification, no one can go to heaven. All of our righteousnesses, the Bible tells us, are as filthy rags. It's in Isaiah chapter 64 and uh, verse 6. Only Christ's righteousness will be accepted by God. The Pharisees and the scribes of that time thought that by my, their meticulous observing of those 613 rabbinical 
traditions, laws, rules, whatever you want to call them, that they were righteous and that that would give them entry into heaven. We know that the scriptures tell us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So there's somewhat of a contradiction. They had an outward appearance of being righteous, of being super pious, but Jesus saw right through that facade. The people of their day had some issues with the Pharisees, but I think they would have said, well, these, are, these men are righteous. Jesus once said of them this in Luke chapter 11, verse 42, you can read, But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe of mint and root and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. These you ought to have done and not to leave the other undone. So Jesus said, yes, you're right in uh, tithing and, and in doing all of the things uh, that are uh, correct and, and so on, but you've missed some things. You've left off judgment and the love of God. And he picked that they weren't really as righteous as they thought they were. The Pharisees were obsessed with an outer cleanliness and a, a separation from sinners. Now you may remember that a few times uh, the Pharisees accused Jesus of being with sinners and basically said, well, you know, what are you doing associating with sinners? You shouldn't be. Now we have a situation a little bit like that, don't we, today? You know, with social distancing. COVID-19, we're not allowed to associate uh, with one another. Um, we have to practice social distancing. We have to practice, you know, the, the hand washing and, and all of those things. Well, the Pharisees, they would have done fine today. It would have been no problem for them because that's what they did. They practiced social distancing from sinners. They are forever washing their hands and, and doing those kind of things, keeping themselves clean. These people, the Pharisees in many ways, live to a higher standard than, uh, than we do. Yet God says that we must exceed that level, their standard, to be allowed into heaven. It's possible to look good on the outside and be absolutely defiled inwardly. You know, you've probably heard the story about the little boy who was cleaning the windows. And he was cleaning the outside of the glass and he was rubbing and scrubbing and carrying on and he just couldn't get the window clean. Well, he was cleaning the outside of the glass, but the dirt was on the inside of the glass. Jesus said that the trouble with the Pharisees was something like that. And in Matthew 23, verse 25, down for a bit, he says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whitened sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of uncleanliness. Now Jesus was saying to these Pharisees, whom he had told his disciples and he tells us, that we have to exceed their righteousness. He's telling them, they look great on the outside, but inside it's not so good at all. So what about the shortcomings of men? If good works and religious rituals can produce a religious exterior but not a righteous interior, what is Jesus talking about? Just what is God's standard for admission to heaven anyway? I mean, we would say as Christians that we need to do those things that are right. And we would also say as Christians that, uh, you know, a, a tree is known by its fruit. So you can 
say that uh, we should be able to tell uh, that you're a Christian by the things that you do. And that's true. But the things that you do do not gain you entry into heaven. We cannot be absolutely perfect. The only hope that any of us have of entering into heaven is to be righteous and as holy as the Lord Jesus himself. And that's God's standard. And that applies to everybody. For in heaven there will be no sin. Holiness, that wonderful foundational attribute of God, will reign in heaven and there will be no sin there. So the question is, how do we measure up against God's standards. All of us are declared to be sinners. The Bible is very clear about it. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. You can read that in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Also, the scriptures say this in Galatians 3, 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. The scripture hath concluded all under sin. Everyone sinned. Why? That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. The promise of faith by, of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. The very best that men can produce is flawed. We are never going to be perfect. As good as we might try to be, if we're honest with ourselves, we're just not always good. We are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Even the great apostle Paul didn't want to face God in his own righteousness. He understood that was a problem. And he said uh, about that, he said, and being found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. He was wanting to not try to face God with the things that he'd done by trying to keep the law or rules or regulation or anything else, but that he wanted to be there in God's presence by the faith of Jesus Christ. Paul knew his works couldn't save him. And we need to know that same truth. So what's the solution? What's God's answer to this problem? When Jesus said that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, shall in no way enter into the kingdom of heaven, he was alluding to this fact that apart from being declared righteous in Christ, no one, can enter into the kingdom of heaven. All our righteousnesses, as we've mentioned, are not worth a hill of beans. The Bible says they're just filthy rags. They account for nothing. Only Christ's righteousness will be accepted by God. The Pharisees and the scribes thought that by their meticulous observing of all of those rules and regulations, that they would be righteous. They had that outward appearance. It looked like they did everything okay. You know, it's, it's equivalent of us, of, you know, turning up for church on Sunday morning and, and prayer meeting on Wednesday night and, and tithing and, and doing, helping out around the church and doing all kinds of nice and good things and visiting people and being kind and generous and all that's great. But in and of itself, it doesn't save us. It gives us an outward appearance, perhaps. But sometimes even that outward appearance is known to be something else by those who are closest to us and know us best. And Jesus saw through the facade. God knows who we are and the depth and the extent of our fallen nature. The Bible tells us in Psalm 103, verse 14, he knoweth our frame and remembereth that we are dust. Wow, just dust. 
And it's by His grace, His mercy, that we're saved. God knows that uh, we as uh, humans, human beings, can never earn salvation. We can never be good enough for heaven because none of us, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, have lived a perfect life without sin. Therefore, he made a way whereby sinners could be made righteous and meet his standards, those high standards of holiness. And God's plan is a multi-step plan that's guaranteed to bring you to a state of true righteousness, of holiness and perfection and give you the ability, I suppose I might say, of standing before God. Now, this is an old plan. This is not a new plan that I dreamed up. It's in the scriptures. Amen. It involves faith and not works. Sometimes our faith is evidenced by works. That's true enough. For instance, by faith, Noah built an ark to save his family. People saw that Noah was somebody who had believed God. They thought he was nuts, I'm sure. No one had ever seen rain. No one had ever seen a flood. And here's Noah building an ark, a boat. Well, it took him a long time, but he did it by faith. So his faith was evidenced by his work. When you think about Abraham, Abraham was instructed to leave his home in Ur of the Chaldees and go to a place that God would show him. And so he packed up his home and headed off, not really knowing where he was going. But God blessed him and led him to the land and made him the father of a nation. And so we find that uh, faith is required and it's often seen in what we do, how we go about it. And the Bible says that that faith was counted for righteousness. Mm. In Romans chapter 4, verse 3, that's what it says. God's plan also involves his grace. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace are ye saved by faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. By grace you are saved, by faith. God's plan involves his grace. His giving to us of something that we are not deserving of. That's grace. And God's plan involves justification. That is, being made righteous. The Bible says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's Romans chapter 5 and the first verse. No longer is there a barrier, that barrier of sin, it comes between us and God. Being justified by faith has removed the offences of sin in God's eyes and we are therefore at peace with him. And how is that? That's because of Jesus Christ. So God's plan also results in the security of eternal life. The Bible says in John chapter 10, verse 28, This is Jesus speaking. He says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The wonderful thing about salvation, about trusting in Jesus Christ, making him to be your Lord and Saviour, believing that he is who he says he is and did what he said he did, means that we have eternal life. Eternal being forever. And it can't be lost. And so God's plan results in security, eternal security. But God's plan also involved a price. There was a price to pay. At great cost to himself, we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And you well know that wonderful passage of Scripture, for God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should have everlasting life. That leads us to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And herein is where righteousness is found. Not our righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ, which is imputed to us or applied to us. The Apostle Paul said that we should keep this in memory. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3 and 4, he says this. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And so it is that we see that's the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And why did all that happen? So that you and I could have the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to us. He died to pay the penalty for our sins. Uh, we agree that we have all sinned. And being sinners, we cannot enter into the presence of God in heaven because God is holy. And so we need some way of dealing with that. So we need righteousness. Well, the Pharisees had a form of righteousness that was seen but Jesus said our righteousness needed to exceed that. It needed to be more than just an outward appearance of righteousness. It needed to be a righteousness that was imputed to us that was ours. And so through Christ, we have that righteousness. And God's plan involved an eternal heavenly heart. The Bible tells us in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and of course, you can look in Revelation chapter one, uh, chapter twenty one, and verse four two, to find out a bit about heaven. But it says this in First Corinthians. But it's written, "I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him." When God says those that love Him, they also mean those that love the Lord Jesus Christ. Loving the Lord Jesus Christ, believing in him, trusting in him for our salvation, understanding he's the son of God who died on the cross of Calvary, shed his precious blood to pay the penalty for our sin because there must be a, a price paid when we believe in that. We can have that home in heaven. So when Jesus said that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. He was saying that the facts are that apart from being declared righteous in Christ, there is no other way of entering into the kingdom of heaven. Looking right and being right are not always the same thing, are they? You know, we can look pretty smick on the outside. But what's the inside like? We need to get that inside right. And that's how we do. Uh, that's what's done through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The answer to righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees is really quite simple. Trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal saviour. It's the righteousness of Christ that's greater than that of the scribes and Pharisees and far greater than all our own kind of made-up righteousness and good deeds and other things. All our good deeds and our best intentions cannot compare to the righteousness of the Son of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, if you were there that day and Jesus said to you, look, I, I see the Pharisees, you know, they, they appear pretty good and they seem like they're righteous, but I'm telling you, 
unless your righteousness exceeds their righteousness, you're not going to go to heaven. I wonder what we would say. How would we think? What would we do? Well, we have an answer, and that is to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. So how do you rate your righteousness right now, today? Do you think you have a place in heaven? A place reserved there to be there with the Lord Jesus Christ because of your faith, your trusting, your believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he is and has done? Is there a place in heaven for you? Or are you somehow confused and thinking that your own works, the things that you do, are what count? Think about it. Because Jesus Christ is our righteousness. And in him we will find our way to heaven. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do just praise you today and thank you. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful words of Scripture that take away the confusion that we might find and think. And Heavenly Father, that declare to us quite clearly that our righteousness cannot be as that of any man except the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so, Lord, I pray today for those who may not know Christ as their Saviour or who may be wondering about how they get to heaven. But, Lord God, I pray that they might exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees or any other men by trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Hall, if you would uh, come and lead us in a concluding hymn. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Shalabair. I hope you enjoyed that message. If, if you got up and left somewhere in that message, if you just have returned, I encourage you to listen to that message again. Having Christ's righteousness imputed to, to us by faith. That's the gospel plan. Faith and belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Uh, let's go to uh, 411. The Solid Rock.
Wow, what a great message. What a, uh, and think, uh, it was Pastor Shellebear preaching it to us. We got taught that today, reminded that uh, uh, today, and it came from, uh, as you saw in, in our biblical text, it came from the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. What a, what a great truth. And then the, the song kind of just reminded us of it. It's his righteousness that we're dressed in. Uh, that's the only type of people that get to heaven. Doesn't matter what kind of works you've done, what kind of sacraments you've performed, uh, what kind of deeds you've done. It's only the righteousness of, of, of the Lord Jesus imputed to us through faith in his death, burial, and resurrection. What a good uh, gospel message. Uh, tell that to someone. Hand them a track or invite them to come and listen to the sermon uh, with you uh, right there from the, uh, the archives on the, on the YouTube channel. All right, let's, uh, let's thank the Lord for this. Dear Lord, thank you for the, the preaching of your word today that we've heard. Thank you for your wonderful gospel plan that, that uh, you planned uh, in ages past. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit uh, agreed on the gospel plan, and then down through the ages, it's been enacted so that we could be saved from sin and from hell, so that we could gain Admission, admission and entrance. This only, this only way through the gospel plan that we could uh, enter heaven. Thank you for the, the teaching and preaching of your word. Lord, help us to rejoice in it. Uh, we who are saved, who are believers, who are on our way to heaven. Lord, help us to tell others about it. Help us to invite others to, to read and see and understand and believe the gospel truth that they too might be saved. Lord, we pray that you'd uh, bless uh, this week now. Help us to live for you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.